dear principal, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear students. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Today I feel greatly honored and humbled at the same time to be a part of this August gathering and to share the stage with such great personalities. Allow me to confess that I am neither a scholar nor uh, do I have a priestly background. But being given this opportunity, I consider it a great honor to introduce the Islamic perspective on women empowerment. I am a practicing Muslim woman who, tra who takes pride in managing my duties uh, as a role as a citizen, a wife, daughter, and an employee, and a member of the peaceful religious community deriving guidance from my faith to fulfill all the roles in the best possible manner. The subject of today's seminar is vast, and as such, I am overawed. I hope Allah enables me to present a few good thoughts before you all. Many people argue about women empowerment as an ultimate solution to all problems which women face today hoping an educated, employed, and financially independent woman can live a life which she has been waiting for ages. But with due respect to one and all, what is the reality? Irrespective of women's educational qualifications, she is harassed, molested, everywhere she goes, or even at her home. Her uh, wealth is eyed and utilized, her wishes are curtailed in the name of customs and norms. She is used, abused, and commodified. Though in our country, gruesome rapes have occupied and troubled our conscience recently, but this is not the only thing. Crimes and injustice against women starts even before her birth, continues all through her life. Female feticide, malnourishment, Illiteracy, dowry, domestic violence, harassment at work, at home, are just to name a few problems she faces. Media today, which calls itself a savior and true sympathizer of women, shamelessly prints, publishes, and runs ads with nude pictures, almost nude pictures of women, commodifying them for their selfish economic interests. Activists who hold candlelight marches and violent protests where do they go when women are harassed and molested in broad, broad daylight? On our streets, in buses, parliamentarians who are passing bills and making laws, some on and off record, express their lewd and shocking ideas about women. In such an environment of tokenism, appeasement, and betrayal done in the name of empowerment, while horrific disgrace, brutalities, and injustice happening to women around us continues. It's time we shun these borrowed concepts of Western liberalization, emancipation, and empowerment of women. It's high time we deconstruct these ideas and take a fresh look, keeping in mind of the reality, who women are and what they really aspire for. I confine myself to the teachings of Islam, establishing fundamentals which could ensure a society where women are truly empowered not just by economic or e employment status, but due to her dignity, equality, and entitlement of due rights. Today, we do have many laws and rights to assure the safety and security of women, but still, she's being persecuted, not outside, but inside the confines of her homes, as I mentioned, where the assaulters are known to the women, hence it is more difficult to raise the voice against such a crime. Hence, crimes are com committed by the nearest of family members, something which law or police are unable to stop. These acts are because of the perverted minds, the minds who consider women to be inferior and an object of fulfillment of desires. As Dr. Paramvi Singh also mentioned in his speech, unless the respect and dignity of women is instilled in the mind and heart, women can't be safe inside or outside. The so-called modern world, especially the West, often regarded Islamic women as backward in the male-dominated world. 
On the contrary, Islam was the first religion to formally grant women the status never known before. The Holy Quran contains hundreds of teachings which apply both to men and women alike. The moral, spiritual, and economic equality of men and women are propagated by Islam is uh, what is being propagated by Islam is unquestionable. The specific verses of the Holy Quran which address to men or women deal with either their physical difference or the role they each have to play in safeguarding the moral fiber of the society. In the divine scheme of regulation, relationship between man and women, Islam has assigned a position of great dignity and honor to women. Such beneficent regulation is essential for peace, comfort, happiness, continuation of species and progress. The Holy Prophet has admonished he says, paradise lies at the feet of your mothers. He has emphasized the importance of mothers in so, at so many instances. One of them is so, paradise lies at the feet of your mothers. The, regarding women as a daughter, he says, he who brings up his daughters well makes no distinction between them and his sons will be close to me in paradise. The Holy Quran emphasizes that God in his perfect wisdom has created species in pairs. O mankind, be mindful of your duty to your Lord who created you from a single soul and from it created a mate and from the two created many and spread many. Islam denounced the attitude of women being inferior to men and raised women to a position of spirituality with, which is in power with man. It held that man and women complemented each other and were a means of mutual fulfillment. For instance, it said, they are a garment for you and you are a garment for them. Chapter 2, verse 188. Let's look at spiritual equality. There is a verse which says, chapter 33, verse 36, it says, for men who submit themselves to Allah and women who submit, for men who believe, women who believe, for men who obey and women who obey, for men who are truthful, women who are truthful, men who guard their chastity, women who guard their chastity, men who remember Allah and women who remember Allah, Allah has prepared forgiveness and a great reward. For the perpetrators, there is a warning in chapter 24, verse 36, the perpetrators of crime are warned. Those who culminate chastity, those who culminate chastity, unwary, believing women are cursed in this world and in the hereafter. But for them is a grievous chastisement on the day when their tongues, their hands, their feet shall all bear witness against them as to what they used to do. Chapter 24, verse 5. So be it man or women, we will be rewarded as we do. For chapter 4, verse 125, whoso does good, whether man or female, is and is a believer, shall enter paradise, and they shall not be wronged of it. Men and women are divine bounty for each other, and as such, must cherish, must be cherished as a means of fulfillment of winning the pleasure of God. He who has created both knows their weaknesses and their strength, and he has, of his grace, furnished adequate guidance for the safeguarding, for, safe, for safeguarding them against their weaknesses and fostering their strength. Mischief, ruin, mischief and ruin ensue upon the disregard of that guidance, and careful observance renders life serene and joyful. Man's mind receives impressions through hearing, sight, and other senses, which incites him to virtue or vice. So he is, man is cautioned, follow not that which thou hast no knowledge, for the ear, the eyes, and the mind shall be called into account. That was from chapter 17, verse 36. Thus, 
restraint of the senses and constant watchfulness over them is a sense of righteousness the direction set out above are designed to secure the highest standards of good behavior for men and women and they should carry themselves with dignity self restraint in all situations okay let us now look at when in um, in this I mean, when were women's rights given uh, in terms of laws in France in the year 1790 equal inheritance right was given that was in the year 1790 equal inheritance right was given and which was later on abolished the first women's university was founded in USA in the year 1821 in the year 1839 in great britain it was made possible for mothers to be made a guardian of children after their divorce before which i mean after if a woman were to get divorced she could not be the guardian of the children but in 1839 in great britain this law was passed and in india in the year 1870 the mur murder of female in infants were banned there is a law uh, which was constituted in 1870 that the murder of female infants are banned but then unfortunately this is 2013 and i must say that this law is just a law and it female infanticide and feticide still continue in our country that is the sorry state of affairs while these reforms to grant rights to women in today's modern society started only around the 19th century and are still continuing some 14 1400 years ago in 622 ad in arabia the constitution of medina was declared which outlines legal status of women in islam which has the right to marry with choice and the right to divorce was chapter 4 verse 36 if you fear a breach between them then appoint an arbiter for his from his folk and an arbiter from her folk if they deserve reconciliation allah will effect it in between them the next right is right to remarry for widows or divorcee islam has given a right for divorce a woman can get divorced and a widows can be remarried and right to own and inherit property women were given the rights to own and to inherit property and right to alimony then women were also given the right to legal recourse in case of abuse right to education for instance seeking knowledge is the duty of every muslim man and women it this is a hadith with with relation to the right to education right the other right was to right, the right to work equal share in affairs of life now let us look at the economic position of women of the faiths islam has been foremost in assigning to women a position of economic independence in islam the independent economic position of women has been established since the very beginning mention has been made of the obligation of a husband to make a settlement on the wife in proportion to his means at the time of marriage this settlement is called meher if at the time of the death of the husband the wife's meher should still be unpaid it ranks as a debt to be discharged out of his estate in priority to all other debts in addition the widow is entitled to her share in the husband's estate which is determined by law any property that a woman might acquire by her own effort or might inherit as an heir or receive as a legacy or a gift belongs to her independently she may ask her husband to manage it but if she chooses to manage it or administer it herself he cannot interfere in her management or administration a married woman who possesses means of her own and in most cases does contribute a portion or a whole of her independent means towards the upkeep of the household but is a, uh, in but is in under no obligation to do so the upkeep of the household is the entire responsibility of the husband even when the wife in her own right better off than her husband 
the upkeep of the household is a responsibility of the husband and not of the women even if she obliges but still the responsibility belongs to the husband the islamic system of succession and inheritance set out in chapter 4 in verses 12 and 13 and in verse 177 aim at the wide distribution of property there is no room for discrimination between the heirs under islamic system of inheritance for instance exclusion of females it's not allowed in islam okay. in conclusion i would like to reiterate that islam is a discipline aimed at making our individual and social life at peace it ensures women is dignified for her merit rather than objectified it gives her high status for being the nurturer and the source of warmth and love I hope the whole society realizes this and values it in its true sense. We as the Ahmadiyya Muslim community being spread in over 200 countries are striving for the last 110 years to propagate the beautiful message of Islam and spread the message of peace and the message of our community love for all hatred for none. In the end I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all the guests and to the college administration in particular to the principal for the warm welcome it which touched me and to the department of political science mr harinder pal singh and miss bhavna malik who very generously gave me this honor to be a part of this seminar thank you very much and uh, a special thanks to all the students thank you so much for your attention thank you so much may allah bless you all